Good evening and welcome. My name is Tony Brewer and along with Joan Hawkins and Kyle Quass, I am a co-producer of this, the Writers Guild Spoken Word series coming to you live stream from Bloomington, Indiana, uh, with folks streaming in from, let's see, Seattle and Eureka and Toledo uh, and Massachusetts, I believe, is where everyone is calling in from tonight. So we're glad you are here with us. Uh, we are sponsored in part by the Indiana Arts Commission, the Bloomington Arts Commission, and the Bloomington Urban Enterprise Association. The Writers, Guild's, Writers Guild of Bloomington wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University and the city of Bloomington were built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. I have just three brief announcements and then we'll get rolling with our fantastic features this evening. Third Sunday Write, our workshop, the Writers Guild workshop, Third Sunday Write is currently a virtual place to find writing prompts and the company of other writers. Members visit a private Facebook page to respond to prompts that are posted monthly. You may then write and post any time during the month and offer a response to the writing of others by sharing a readback line. That's a line from their piece in the comments. Third Sunday uh, will at some point in the future uh, meet again at the Monroe County Public Library, but we're gonna remain virtual for the foreseeable future. For more information or to join the group, contact Shauna Ritter at shauna747 at gmail.com. Please include third Sunday in your subject line. Also wanted to mention the first Sunday prose reading and open mic coming up this Sunday, February 6th at 3 p.m. live and in person with featured readers Alan Balkema and Jane Goodman. That is followed by an open mic and that is taking place at Morgan Stern's Books, 849 Auto Mall Road. That's in the old Pier 1 Imports location. That's uh, Sunday, February 6th at 3 p.m. Also a reminder that the Writers Guild monthly business meeting is Saturday, February 19th at 3 p.m. via Zoom. All of this info and more is available on our website, uh, which is www.writersguildbloomington.com. All one word, writersguildbloomington.com. You can also like, follow, subscribe, whatever you want to do on uh, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And I also strongly encourage you to sign up for our newsletter also on our website. Uh, Joan Hawkins does a fantastic job curating our newsletter for us. And that's it for me. Uh, so we've got three fantastic features this evening. Uh, we've got music by Forbes Graham uh, and three poets, Will Gibson, uh, Hilda Davis, and Carrie Troutman. And I believe first up, we're going to hear from Forbes Graham with a bit of music. Forbes Graham is a composer, musician, sound artist, and visual artist whose work explores themes of simultaneity, perceptibility, transformation, and collage. He is the creator and producer of Beyond Apex, a bi-weekly podcast dedicated to showcasing contemporary and experimental music. To date, this show has featured the works of over 100 composers and creatives. Later this month on February 28th, Forbes will perform on the world premiere of Beings by Eric Rubles at Roulette in Brooklyn. I'm going to put a couple of URLs uh, for all of that uh, in the chat and up on Facebook. Please welcome Forbes Graham.
Right on. That was wonderful. Thank you, Forbes Graham. Who, man, the, yeah. Uh, Joan mentioned the the layering in there is just phenomenal. That's wonderful. We'll be hearing some more from uh, Forbes a little later on. Let us now bring up our first feature for this evening. Will Gibson. Will Gibson currently lives in Humboldt County, California, where the trees are big, and he currently lives in. Uh, excuse me. He currently serves as Eureka, California's poet laureate. He has had five collections published by Kind People and has been included in a number of anthologies and lit mags, both online and in print, such as Marsh Hawk Review, Button Poetry, Midwestern Gothic, Drunk in a Midnight Choir, Cascadia Rising, Collective Unrest, Yellow Chair Review, and many more. He has twice been nominated for both the Pushcart and Best of the Net, is a community board member of Word Humboldt, co-owns Reworded, a poetry-only bookstore with his patient partner, Susanna, and is editor-in-chief of Swimming with Elephants, Elephants Publications. I'm going to put his website in the chats as well. Please welcome Will Gibson. That's me. Hi. Um, I have not, like... Uh, read poems for an audience in a very long time. I host readings, but I, I generally don't read my poems. Uh, last night I did one just to kind of get myself ready for this. Um, before I begin though, Tony, I was, uh, I found a poem of yours, You and I Are Human Beings. Oh, uh, oh, comfort you and I are the muse when this world is like this and it is never not exactly this. You're awesome, dude. You're a really great writer. Uh, okay, now my poems. All right. Um, a friend of mine named Ryan McClellan, who is a fabulous poet in his own right. He lives in Nashville, Tennessee currently. Um, he used to live with uh, Bo Williams and I in Portland, Maine. Uh, it was a crazy house to live in, uh, but he wrote a poem called When I Die, and I have, and I'm still uh, running a contest where you can submit to uh, my email, uh, will.gibson at outlook.com. Um, you can submit your own When I Die poem. Uh, the only two 
real requisites are uh, don't don't be a sad sack. And if you say don't cry for me, I'm not going to publish it because that's a lie. Uh, you want somebody to miss you. You know, you want somebody to miss you and, and everyone should. Um, and so uh, I'd like to start with my uh, poem, When I Die, after Ryan McClellan. One, when I die, burn me up, put me in a salt shaker and scatter my ashes in several spots across the country. One last road trip, ocean to ocean. Outside of Portland, Maine, there is a lighthouse almost overtaken by sea monster memories. At this lighthouse, there is a rock. On this rock, a poet more well known than talented wrote a famous poem about a lighthouse while looking at this lighthouse. Put a bit of me on that rock and watch me blow out over the ocean. I always felt hated me. Once, when I was wandering the country, I found the perfect waterfall somewhere in the Smoky Mountains. It had four slow tiers with a tub-sized rock lined pool at the third tier and a smooth stream that led away just deep enough for fish and turtles to swim unafraid. I stayed there for a week before looking for a town to resupply in, always planning to return. I could never find it again. I do not expect you to find it either. Any quiet roadside cascade will do. Shake some of me on the roots of the nearest tree. Don't take me to Ohio. I got warrants. Leave a little bit of me in the grass next to mama. I've written a million words why. Roll a tiny bit of me in a fat strawberry flavored blunt, like the blunt, like huge and uh, don't come with no bullshit where you get higher off my ashes than the weed either. That's that's not going to work. Top shelf. Smoke as much as you can stand at Nano spot. Leave the roach for him. It's just a headstone, but somehow he always does. Leave some of me in the Mississippi. Tennessee was always a death to me. A bit of me in my river, the mother of the South, let me mix with the muddy water I love like it was my blood and a bit in a pool at Graceland. I always wanted to jump into the soft blue oasis. I never had the nerve. Mix a bit of me into the paint on the dead cars at Cadillac Ranch outside Amarillo, Texas. One of my Absolute best days was spent snapping pictures with faux siblings while we stumbled around the monument to other spare parts. Let some of me blow out the window along some strange two-lane lost blacktop somewhere in the southwest. Mountains or desert doesn't matter as long as the sun is shining and the windows are down. Sprinkle the biggest pile of me in our wedding garden where I promised promises I meant more than any word I ever wrote or said. Toss the last bit of me in the only ocean that ever loved me back. Anywhere will do. I just want to be water. I just want to be water. Two, tell my children that I'm sorry, again, that I tried to be a good dad and tell them thank you for forgiving me when I wasn't. Tell Marissa that she was always my baby girl, even when she wasn't. Tell Travis that he is more like me than any of his siblings. Tell James that he has the purest heart of anyone I've ever known. Tell Harvey that I love their name, even though I messed that up at first, and he will always be my kitten. Tell Hunter that his anger will fade, but that fire never will. Tell Alder. He is the bravest person I ever knew. Tell Austin that I tried to be a good dad, not just a father-in-law. Then tear down my office, maybe let it burn too. Poems, books, bongs, pens, posters, and paintings, ghosts, all of it. Let it all purely burn, except the picture of my partner and love of my life when she was at one of her lowest points. This picture was taken of her a long time ago, long before we met, but represents how far people can climb out of their own depths and demand that life give them a fair chance. She made me, she made life take down that picture. She made life back down after that picture was taken. 
the power she doesn't know she has is there to see. Please save that picture from the flames. Tell her to touch that picture when she feels weak. Tell her that there may be some strength left in it. Burn everything else. Headstones are for the living. Let mine be where she can keep it clean. I know she will. Place a granite slab wherever she remembers me most. Ask her to visit me as often as she can, even just to talk about her day, even to tell me about her new loves. I just want to know she's happy. Tell her it's okay to eventually slowly stop coming, to stop thinking of me as often, to move on. I am afraid she will forget me, but I am more afraid I will haunt her. I don't want to be the ghost I have always claimed to be. Tell her to lock the front door at night, to be safe. And then I really tried to fold the towels three times. She just did it better. She did everything better, made everything better. Tell her that she is perfect Then say, don't argue with me. Tell her that every dance, no matter how silly or how much it hurt, my back was worth it, was special to me, and that I remember every spin. Tell her my every joy revolved around her happiness. Um, and again, you can uh, submit to uh, the When I Die Poetry Contest uh, if you send your poem to will.gibson at Outlook, or uh, you can send it to Redwood Reworded at Gmail. Okay. Let's see here. Um, I teach workshops at the jail um, here. Uh, well, I did before COVID. Um, they still haven't let us back in yet. And uh, it was one of my favorite things I've ever done. Um, I, I, I got to see a different side of people that I had been. Um, I had served time before, so it, it was really good to reach out to those folks. Um, and this one is called What He Wanted to Be Was Free. When you ask your student what they wanted to be when they grew up, do not expect him to say anything except anything but this. Every prisoner, no matter how small the sentence or trivial the misdemeanor has remorse at least once. When you think of the times you have been behind bars bask in your remorse, remember how you cried so quietly that no one knew, hopefully, or maybe, the only ones who knew were crying too. Once, while I was incarcerated, another prisoner cried so softly in his cot that his hushed tone was unknown to everyone except me. We never talked about it. We talked about potato salad a lot. He told me his recipe. I still remember. When one of your best and favorite students gets 23 years to life, don't talk to anyone about it. They will not understand because you will not understand. Hold the thought in your brain, make it diamond, make it shine so much that you think he got out. Pretend you saw him on the street, that he waved to you, that he got in your van, that he's coming over for dinner, that you'll make potato salad. It won't be the truth, but it will keep you from getting burned out, from quitting, from giving up, from walking away. When you hear your neighbor sing, I can't help falling in love with you like it was a funeral march, sing along. Don't cry. Write a poem about how it is the saddest song ever written. How the song is actually a metaphor for addiction. How you have let your life be a loop of addiction and recovery. Bask in your recovery, then tear up the poem you didn't mean to write it. Some things are not meant to be. Some things start off as cures, end up as diseases. When your doctor tells you that you've had an improperly healed broken back for more than 25 years, think of all of the strange places you've slept. Think of every uneasy rest. Then rest. Bask in the fact that you have the ability to rest in your own bed, 
whenever you want. Remember those who cannot. Then make dinner for your family. Make potato salad. Use a friend's recipe. Uh, how am I doing on time? We're gonna we're gonna go to the next one. We're gonna go That's to the next one. We'll come back. Yeah, we'll come back Good. to you. Good. I awesome. have my Thanks timing well. right. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks so much for the kind words too. I, I fondly remember you kind of showing up out of the blue here in Bloomington when you were on tour and we managed to scoop you for two days for uh, the Fourth Street Festival. And you did, poetry on demand. you did poetry on demand with us too, like made yeah. poems for free for people. So yeah, it was awesome. That was fun. I, I always it. fondly remember your generosity and um, it was a great reading too, both of them. So Thank thanks you. again. Let's now bring up our next feature, Hilda Davis. Hilda Davis is a writer, educator, and genealogist from Staten Island, New York. Her work has appeared in The Offing, Callaloo, and elsewhere. A graduate of the University of Albany and Indiana University Bloomington, Hilda is currently an adjunct faculty member and holds an MFA in creative writing from New York University. She primarily writes about girlhood, survival, and those she loves who are dead and living. And she's also a mom. Please welcome Hilda Davis. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> um, it's great to be here. Um, the Writers Guild is actually the first organization I read for as an adult. So I was, it's, it's just really great to be back and have this full circle moment. I actually remember Will, I used to host Poetry Slams in Bloomington back in the day, I think five years ago. And um, Will was actually one of the featured poets. So it was great seeing you again and hearing your work. It's always been lovely to hear your stuff. So. Um, I'll get started. Um, life is so much different for me now. I'm a mom. I'm married. Um, I'm not the person I imagine myself to be, but um, I have an MFA. So these are some poems I wrote during the MFA and some poems I wrote while I was still in Bloomington just to throw back. All right. So the first one is Old to Long Distance During the Pandemic. And um, just to preface all my, all my, um, my writing, um, I do that touch on traumatic events, um, infant loss, um, the pandemic, um, just a, a lot of touchy subjects. So feel free to call me out or um, step out if needed. Um, I won't be offended, I understand it's difficult. So, all to long distance during a pandemic. If I catch the Rona or the Coco or whatever we've nicknamed this ill, so we don't say we are scared to die, he is not, he will not be next to me. Haven't slept in days. I do not dream of us dead. Glad since dreams often come true and I dream of us often. Is this a part of love? I want him to be there when I die. I want to be there when he does. That's the truth, sitting on my chest, keeping me up. Can't picture a funeral for him the way I can all my other loved ones. How I track my love for them by this measure. Never tears, but oh, if he goes, I want the musk of scalp under my nose. Bless this scent no one else can produce. When we share a bread, a best, a bed, he lies between my armpit and breast. Before we sleep, I call him by name then by nickname, do what I can to remind him he is my soft spot to land, my sweet dear one. As this virus takes over my city, a lover I thought I'd marry writes me, says, you were always bring home to mama material. You not running around by yourself no more. It feels good, no, and I say it does, and I don't have to lie about whether it feels good and how good it is. All righty. So um, something that um, I, I touch a lot on my work is um, child, uh, childhood, reclaiming childhood. Childhood is like a great time because you have responsibilities, but you also can't like control shit for yourself. So it sucks in that way. So um, just, this is more like a ranty poem. Sometimes you just have to get those feelings off and then move over with your life, right? So this is one of them. On reclaiming childhood. It is hard to realize you are still young when your youth was spent taking care of dying adults, depressed adults, depressed dying adults, 
until one day you are 30 with your deepest existential crisis, yes, there's more than one, being whether you should have waited to complete an arts degree because you found out there are programs where everyone is fully funded with stipends and recognize you are better at social work than poems and you miss spaces where you can be yourself and then not be a big deal for people that you are yourself. So you're 30, sitting in a fruitful living room in Greenwich Village on an old ass computer your older brother built for you, looking up social work programs because you rescinded acceptance to a highly ranked program to write poems at a school you cannot afford as you work full time with high school kids who can give a fuck about your poems or who like the child I wish I could have been want nothing more than for the world to fuck off and let them breathe for but two seconds and in the two seconds I tried to breathe I get a test asking if I'm pregnant no just fat hold on I have can I hold my infant real quick she's it, it bothers me when she cries I'm sorry not bothers me but like I like to comfort her sorry This is Big Marge, y'all. Her name is Aida Margaret. I call her Big Marge. Say hello. Okay. Sorry about that. Mom life is very different. Um, okay. In the two seconds I tried to breathe, I get a, a text asking if I'm pregnant. No, just fat. And that answer typically results in a tirade about the gym and clean eating and Dr. Sebi. But this time I found out people expect you to make other people with your body when you hit a certain age. And I think to the person I'm expected to make subsequent humans with, how we were once 23 year old black kids in the middle of bumblefuck Bloomington. So I placed my worries in a moment that made me love him. My beloved pushes me on a swing feet in the air. I ask, what if I cannot give birth? But he wants to talk about important things, whether I'm happy or if I've stopped loving him, that if not, I shouldn't worry as he has no plans to stop loving me. He pushes me on the swing 10 more times, my fear of heights floating away. In the moment I realize I trust him, he asks if I want ice cream. Dole Whip, he corrects himself since dairy makes us fart in ways that tickle us. Then I understand we are our own children. Hello, Nushi. <laughs> so yes, this is about, this actually happened in Bloomington. So Dole Whip comes from um, the chocolate mousse, if you're familiar, before they knocked down the original one. My now husband and I used to go there all the time. And we used to go to Bryant Park and swing on the swings. And now we have a child together. Um, and I was, supposed, I was supposed to have a hard time having children. So that's what this poem, this poem was written before I had her. And now she's here, now she's here. But we're still very childish, so we're still our own children. All right. What should I read next, Aida? Tell mommy. All right. Um, so becoming a mother, I've actually revisited my relationship with my own mother. It was um, tense for a long time. It's like that with daughters and mothers sometimes. Um, but even in the hard parts to navigate, I recognize that I do love her and she loves me. And um, we're still learning how to love each other. And I think you're, you're always learning how to love your people, no matter how long you know them. So this is called No One Will Go Searching For Us. The grasshopper ice cream shake was amazing, Eric. I miss Bloomington. That's like the main reason I miss Bloomington. Like the, the moose and like four street food was great to me. All right. No one will go searching for us. After I denounced Jesus, I did not hear from mama for three weeks. I stopped getting the missed calls. So I begged the man, I begged to love me, to drive me to Staten Island, to make sure mama isn't dead. When I get to my childhood home, she looks at me, sad like she's thinking, why did you not come home even though I say this isn't home anymore? Didn't you think of the ways I imagine a daughter turns to sludge in this city? How I blame myself for teaching you not to scream even when the blood drains out of you. I think of the ways a black bone transforms into discardable pipe and my pick me all folded, turned over in a landfill and there's silence about the girl whose name only her mother says right. And if no one else knows how to say her name right, does she exist at all outside of her mother's tongue? We never discuss how we imagine each other's funerals. And then this one, I'll stop at this poem because I know I'm running out of time. Um, this one is 
girl imagines herself as Kelly Kapowski. So girl is a, a character. She's me as my younger self. I'll, tell, I'll say that people like the I is not me is the speaker. I'm the speaker of all my poems. I'll admit that. <laughs> so most of my poems. So girl um, is a character that I've wrote, written just to kind of reclaim my voice as a younger person. So thank you. These are ancestral eyes. These are actually my grandfather's eyes, which my mom has, which I had as a child. So thank you very much. Thank you. Say hi, thank you. I love my eyes. <laughs> Say I'm beautiful. Okay. Girl imagines herself as Kelly Kapowski. Excuse my language, Aida. When I fuck a boy who doesn't love me, I imagine reruns of Saved by the Bell. In this episode, Zach follows this brunette around and he does not give up until she gives in and they walk along as if he isn't a creep. In a more restful world, I have the life of a white girl. I've never had the complex of wanting to be someone other than myself. And I don't think white girls better than I because they are not. But I thought white girls lives had no trouble. Thought they'd never have to deal with shit like unrequited love, empty pockets. But then my white girl roommate asked for a tampon and I asked for why and confused she asked for my period. And I give her one in awe because I thought I was the only one out here bleeding. And, oh, and I have one short, one more short one. All right. Um, I have a, a collection I'm working on dedicated to dark skin baddies. So just dark skin um, black women in the media, both popular and, and um, more obscure. So this one is for Grace Jones, Grace Beverly, mm. Beverly Grace Jones, who you may know as a model, um, Look, look Grace Jones up if you, have, if you have never heard of Grace Jones. Very short poem for Grace Jones. Slave to the rhythm for Grace Jones. I muse the fuck out these men. But once they discover that the darkest parts of me are not my erect nipples, nor my forehead turned plum dark from show lights, they leave. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Hilda. Good to see you again. You know, Marge, almost, almost upstays your poems. Almost. <laughs> it's maybe 50-50. I, I don't know. I don't know. I am it's, totally okay with that. It's a tough, it's a tough call. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks you again. You upstage me. That's what you're telling me? <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you, Mama. <laughs> thank you so much, y'all, for listening. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so our third feature tonight is Carrie Troutman, Ohio born and raised Carrie Troutman is a founder of ToledoPoet.com and the Toledo Poetry Museum page on Facebook, both of which were created to help promote Northwest Ohio poet, uh, poetry events. She is a poetry editor for Red Fez, and she has served as a judge and workshop leader for the Northwest, uh, excuse me, the Northwest region of Ohio's Poetry Out Loud competition uh, annually since 2016. You can find Carrie's books and social media links here, I'm going to put the I'm going to put that link in the chat and whatnot. Please welcome Carrie Troutman. Hi there, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with some winter poems. We're expecting a big snowstorm any hour now, so this is a poem from my book Two of Hoped, which is Finishing Line Press, 2015. This is called Stockpile. I barely slept, alert like a dog sensing cyclones, tossing in overhot quilts, waking from dreams of darkness, of cold, of losing my children in crowds, waking to peek through the drapes, nothing, nothing, nothing yet. The last real blizzard, I was two. In photos, my bundled body sunk in roof high drifts, neighborhood legends of digging out, of sharing canned soup, a woman in labor, a roof caved in from weight of powder, and us hold up in our tiny brown walls with stockpile of fire logs, us kids awed by the sudden drama of weather. Now my walls feel brittle and wide, vibrating with gusts of horizontal snow, everything I love scurrying inside, my needs piling up in layers, water, suns, heat, daughter, walls, thinking how to protect it all, to retain it all, to prevent myself from caving in on it all. I bake bread, to busy my hands, serve it warm to my children, watching my neighbors husky frolic in the yard, stupid dog. Since uh, Will had uh, 
Ash's poems. I happen to have one also. This is the grass that it is. As if February weren't bastard enough, Lake Erie rejected my father's ashes, strewn, blown to dinginess atop the ice, refusing to swallow, to digest, to feed what lies below in cold rhythm. In my childhood garden, he snipped asparagus and zinnias into a bait bucket together, green thumbs and electric petals. He taught me to harvest night crawlers for the weekend's fishing. He knived swelled tomatoes to feed me the warm wedges, plucked sugar snap peas, tucking them in my pockets for an afternoon's worth of nibbling, hauled crates of zucchini and crooknecks to his coworkers, grateful and befuddled, plunged his fists into the soil for jeweled beets to slice with Lake Erie perch and picked strawberries for shortcake enough to call the neighbors over. Today, February rains a glaze of ice to my brown lawn, my frozen garden mud. I chop a waxed grocery bell pepper, peel the fibrous ends of a pound of asparagus, revealing itself as the grass that it is. And then um, this is a poem from my book, Artifacts, which is from Night Ballet Press in 2017. This is called Mom's House. I stopped at Mom's to feed her cat while she was on a trip. She left a lamp on, three bowls of water and Fox News on a staticky radio for loneliness. Washing my hands in the bathroom, it was dreamlike that this had once been my daily sink. My small bare toes on this tiled floor. The floors were cold in winter, cold the way LA sinks itself each night into its asphalt secret. In some cold middle of ocean, there is an undulating island of plastic garbage bits because nothing is ever really thrown away. The cat slept in a warm spot by the furnace closet, woke suddenly to bite and lick a hind leg. These ceilings used to hover over my sleep. I have read that volcano ash clouds can drift and linger, darkening and even cooling atmospheres thousands of miles away. The kitchen ceiling has been replaced and its skylights no longer leaking, clean glass views of what's blue. I turned the radio dial to a top 40 instead. The cat kept on licking itself, kept nipping at what itches. And then my last poem for this round, um, this is actually a, a it's kind of a death poem, I guess, but this is called Markers. Some remember the neighbor from his loud music and curtains breathing in and out of unscreened windows propped open with hunks of two by four. But I remember him by his unpicked pear tree, stinking October like bee swarmed mead. I assume something will remain of me, something visitable at which strangers will cluck their tongues. Like pallet wood crosses and plastic carnations pocked in highway crabgrass and milkweed marking past car crashes. Like granite monuments where war battle awfulness occurred. I'd rather be remembered by a dwarf pear tree, low enough to pick, but tall enough to climb. October caterpillars arch curb to curb from the neighbor's empty house to mine. My ghost will be some different version of itself to itself than what people invoke. People project thoughts onto the dead same as they do their dogs. She's watching, she forgives us. She's telling us it's okay to laugh. Someone chase the birds away from that fruit. Someone pick the pears before they sink into the ground and rot before they've been of use. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you, Carrie. Good to see you again. Let us now return to a uh, musical, have a uh, musical interlude by our guest musician tonight, Forbes Graham. Forbes, take it away. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, fantastic. Forbes Graham, everybody. Wow. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of things and trumpet isn't always one of them. Definitely. That's amazing. We'll, uh, we'll have a final piece from Forbes Graham uh, a little bit later. Let's return now to our three featured poets. First up in this round is Hilda Davis. All right. Thank you for that, um, Forbes. It was awesome. I'm, I don't know. If, I'll ask you questions later, but that's I love the sound. It's great. Um, yes. So let me just get into it. The Cure. A girl is attacked on her in a park on her way home. And before running, she's called the crazy bitch. But she gets home. Girl does not know if she's hemorrhaging or if the red on her hands belongs to him. She opens her mother's door, and gets no blood on the knob. Girl's crotch, an infinite ember. Mama snores, crawl down the stairs. Mama works 16 hour days and the insurance is bad. So girl never asks to go to the hospital. Girl never tells mama when things are wrong. Even when the anemia turns her body into slush. Girl is mama's daughter after all. Knows most things can be healed with honey, lemon, and hot water. Add Vicks if necessary. Plan B may not work. Girl goes to Harlem to get her things. Getting your things is the sign the, that the breakup is for real. Her ticket to Indiana is one way. She tells everyone she is going to grad school. She is running from blood. Her old man got a temper. He says baby and pretends he didn't knock the hearing from her skull. The hallways of the fourth floor walk up smell of Detal. Detal is how he always cleans up fights or nights of sex with other women. He asks for her body and she declares her items as hers. He says one last time she catches a tongue in her throat. Her old man reduces her place to put his dick wind board. Her old man can wash her away for a dollar. Girl does not get her things back. Is the breakup for real? Girl is thrown out of the apartment as quickly as he came, uses her last 50 bucks, walks to one of the new big chain drugstores that plague Harlem's once brown delicate face, asks for a morning after pill, prays, makes the two hour commute back to her mama, flies to Indiana two days after. In her first seminar class, girl uses the bathroom breaks to vomit. All she does is sweat and faint. Girl ran from blood and now prays for blood goes to the doctor where the Indiana nurse says, plan B may not work if you weigh more than 176 pounds. Indiana nurse says pregnant. Girl says termination without a thought. Nurse says the, fe the fetus is a human being. Girl says, me too. Two weeks pass. Girl's decision can only be made, can only be acted upon every other Thursday. Doctor splits girl's crotch wide with metal, says this should not hurt since you were ready to open your legs before this. Thick, clear devices connected to girls sucking, filling, the sucking, filling, excuse me, bright red, the way children enjoy the ends of Slurpees. The nurse wraps what could have been in a blue sheet, runs out of the room. Sometimes girl imagines what grew out, what grew inside of her, still floating in a biohazard tank, waiting to heal. Girl imagines the roots of a sycamore tree growing in a dumpster. Questions for my father in heaven. What if the abortions were my only chance at progeny? Will I like you always long for more children? Will the man I lay with at 21 become my unsatisfying love the way my mother was yours? Will people start to recognize me only through callus and the stench of Suda? Will I be taken slowly, opiate addicted and cadaverous, forgetting the names of my loved ones? In my oblivion, will I remember to call out the name of Jesus or will my death be swift, violent, the way you cut cane with a machete to teach me sweetness? Um, as time continues, I learn the different ways. I mourn you. And each method is more freeing than the last. 
Sometimes I weep and weep and become kin to the originator of weeping. At times I laugh my mouth wide. I remember thinking of jokes while bathing that you had undeniably terrible teeth. And there are moments when I hum old reggae songs to myself and sway lightly at bus stops, or I sit behind a plate, a plate of chicken wings, devouring, ensuring there's nothing on the bone, thinking of all the delicious things you taught me. If life goes the way I want it to go, I will have more years without you, without you than with you. In the moment I realized this, this, maybe I'll be teaching my sons to crack the Osain, enjoy the marrow, or I'll be doing my daughter's hair in the way you tried, each attempt ending with my wearing a hat. Yes, I'll be doing something soft and delicate, bending a child's ear down, trying to slick each curl back. We'll tell them their grandfather in his rugged unknowing did the best he could. And for that, the blood and whatever we do with the life made from this blood is good. Thank you. Oh, actually one more, sorry. One more for this set. I think I have a minute, so I'll be quick. October Elegy. There are enough photos and albums to prove I once had a father. But if you are actually gone, then what, uh, what was the purpose of all the kites in the sky the, on the day I got engaged? And where did my shame of you being a truck driving kite maker go? And what of the trucks that keep me company on the road when I take cross country trips at 4 a.m.? And what of your diary I never saw while you were alive, which I am now driven to translate and share with your loved ones? I uncover it, folding your old shirts for the 11th time, each folding on the anniversary of your death. And what of this, my still being here, even when I tried not to be, I have never met a spirit who wanted to die twice, and you used to say we were each other down to the teeth, said we were both born on the 11th, your gift to me whenever I'd miss you. When people ask, and of your, and of your father, I tell the truth, he's in the ground. If I am to tell the other part of the truth and say he is everywhere, 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 he will stop coming to me in dreams, not apocalyptic ones, because sometimes our dead want us to know too much, but the good ones, where I'm a child and all my teeth are gone, and my father puts a nickel in my hand for penny candy, caramel, all caught in my gums. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Hilda. Those are tough and tender poems. Everyone's commenting in the chat. Uh, thanks so much, really appreciate those, yeah. Let's hear now from our, our other, uh, another feature, Carrie Troutman. Hi there. So I'm going to turn to this book, To Be Nonchalantly Alive, that was released uh, from Kelsey Books in 2020. Um, there are a lot of poems in here about fires. I tend to write um, about fires. This one is called 15 Minutes, and it's about the Hartford Circus fire, which happened in 1944. Even the greatest show pieces on earth are flammable. Pink tutus strapped around elephant hides by muscled trainers, even their biceps and suspenders, even a proboscis and feathered headdress and the five lions perched up and over a steel arch. Even the aerialists, their sequined leotards, the whips and chairs of tiger tamers, the high wire unicycles, ballet slippers, the ringmaster's top hat and silk tailcoat. Even the clowns painting themselves in the dressing tent, craning grease painted ears toward a chorus of chaos, lifting the lower canvas flap to see stories high flames and black peanut tiger popcorn smoke, especially the 120 ton big top tent rainproofed with gasoline and paraffin, which melts and showers incinerating droplets to wooden bleachers and collapsing tree trunk posts even the parents, even as they scream themselves back into smoke clouds of bursting balloons and candy apples, dragging small screaming blackened bodies to finish smoldering in the summer sun. 167 charred bodies stacked in mud, dressed in what's left of their sooty Sunday best. Zebras and giraffes stomping in the menagerie tent, smelling what's coming. Yay, a day at the circus. Um, this is a poem I wrote for uh, my late friend, John Swale. This is called Food for the Dead. 
Dressing in black for you and for those you've left in no need of color today, I prepare to cook some food you will never eat, but just the rest of us. The taste on our tongues, you on our brains. I wonder what to feed those left behind a dead man. What flavors should accompany our recitation of your poems, our remembrance of your laugh, your sweat, your anxious stroking of hair from your brow with voice booming sweetly. I remember the last food you made for me, a white brick of cream cheese softened a bit from the warm car ride, plopped from its silver wrapper to an oval yellow platter topped with a jar's worth of jalapeno jelly, wet green as any summer. It isn't hot, you assured me, scraping a glob with a butter knife onto a golden cracker. It's sweet, you said, chewing, and your lips wouldn't lie, would they? And someone handed me a glass of wine I hadn't asked for, and someone else read a poem, and you held up a finger which meant, wait for me to swallow, I have something I must say. And you scooped me a cracker, glistening green, swirled with creamy white like jewels in, in snow, and I shoved it whole into my mouth, and damn, if it wasn't sweet after all. Almost everything I've read tonight has been kind of a bummer, so I want to read something that's a little lighter. Uh, this is called To the Roofers. An isolated May hailstorm ping-ponged ice balls through car windshields, obliterated rose bushes, cracked mailboxes, street signs, and swing set slides, and all summer long, that half hour storm has brought you men from, I imagine, several counties. Scores of tanned skin teams hammering the curbsides clogged with trucks and dumpster bins and tow behind trailers heaped with asphalt shingles. You perch atop steep peaks, scrape and shave debris to tarps below draped over hedgerows, enjoying the necessary destruction, the smoothed readied surface in your wake. You unroll sheets of black tar paper, sealing with slamming thumps of your gun, the repeated reverb rumbling the bones of your arms for deltoids. You arrange the stiff, glimmery shingles, your keen eyes conscious of correct overlapment, pleased by the perfection of pattern, at the time of day measured in covered square footage. The neighborhood wives ogle from windows, standing far enough inside to be inconspicuous, fanning their flushed faces with insurance checks. They hope the pool of skilled men is not stretched too thin. They compare crews, hoping the thumping above their own heads is from the brightest of the hammer swingers, that theirs are the men who loved spirograph as children and erector sets. For their next door neighbors, they prefer the strongest of your lot, overheating, peeling damp shirts from your planked backs, hair a bit longer and looser than their husbands, bending lithe legs to reach for a Coke. You tower from precarious peaks like the bronze statue of the city's founder atop its town hall, a city founded upon the values of musculature, sweat, and denim shorts. It's all for me this round. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Carrie. <clears throat> uh, last up in the second round, Will Gibson. You all are so talented. This is, this is a lot of fun. Thank you all for having me. i uh, really enjoying this. Um, this one is called 62919. Uh, I'm sorry, 62920. I can read my own handwriting. That's, that's fine. Uh, um, my wife is a nurse. Um, she just got her nurse practitioner license. license. She was working full time and going uh, to her classes, um, of course, online uh, all throughout the pandemic. Uh, stayed working full-time while she was in school full-time. Uh, pretty proud of that. Uh, but she's, uh, she's quite a woman. Um, but suffice it to say, uh, being married to a nurse in a pandemic is not the easiest thing in the world. Um, so yeah. Being married to a nurse during a pandemic is like watching someone else write your poem. 
the first draft comes with the morning press conference. Twitter is a form that changes with each new hashtag. The edit comes with the nightly body counts. I wonder every day if this is the day she gets sick, if this is the last poem I will write for her. The pains in my back are getting worse. I do not tell my wife. She has enough worry for five families. She has been a hero of mine since I first got to know her. Now the world calls her a hero for doing what she has always done. Well, I wonder what it took them so long. She is a hero that hunts a new monster, a monster that has us all hiding in our homes that turns you monster without your knowledge. I think now of how easy it is to become a monster. If you cough in public, you will grow horns only others can see. On a shopping trip, my wife was worried that my panic attack might be seen as sickness, that other shoppers might lash out at us. On that same shopping trip, a woman wore a mask and gloves while her granddaughter had neither, and I stared at her until her gray hair turned horns, until she was a monster. The Chopin papilloma virus causes rabbits to grow keratinous carcinomas that resemble horns. This is where the myth of the jackalope comes from. Proof that viruses can in fact cause horns, invent new monsters from harmless animals. My wife is better at being a nurse than I am at being a human being. My wife still volunteers at the needle exchange Another place society thinks turns humans into monsters. My wife loves monsters into humans, tries to make humans love monsters in any way she can. While I was writing this poem, my wife was at work as a nurse during a pandemic. I stopped writing when she came home today. She came home today. Um, she and I have written a lot. My wife is also a fabulous poet. Um, I say all the time, I'm the worst writer in the family. My uh, stepson was the youth poet laureate on the last term. Um, the, the youngest boy is 14. And uh, if I read some of his poems today, no one would bat an eye. Like they're, they're absolutely amazing. I, I'm a big, big fan of his. Um, let's see. Um, speaking of uh, my family, I'll read this one. Um, my my uh, oldest stepson uh, is about to be, a, well, he's, he's 18 now, but he's about to go off to college. Um, and so I wrote him this poem called Before Flight, from Dedalus to Icarus, or good luck being a poet from Will to Harvey. I know the dangers of flight, my limitless child. These wings have never been our weapons. We will not be heroes. I have tried to keep snakes silent to the behaviors that caught us in this poetic maze. I helped design this prison as a punishment for love. Now we find ourselves both thrown in this labyrinth together and for the same reason, although love of something is the recipe for every escape. There is no thread to leave behind to find our way out. We have only the sky as an option. I know you are scared. So am I. So is everyone willing to build their own wings we are all born with the tools to make them our wings. Very few ever try out of the fear, the heights it might take them to. Others do not think of the crash. I have taught you everything I can about flight. If you fly too low, the crashing waves of those who can't fly will weigh down your wings with their water. You will spend all of your time explaining your wings and not enough time to use them. Above you, the sun burns with the fire of self-doubt if you get too close, child. The heat will make you melt into the sea. Do not let this world melt your wings, child. Fly on through the imposters and imposter syndrome, through 
the editors and dead enders fly through submissions and rec rejections through the falsely constructed ceilings and loose floorboard metaphors fly steady and true and real. You have the power to be the most majestic creature in the sky if you just tell yourself that you are. Please tell yourself that you are. Please, my child, do not let them carve a cautionary tale on your tombstone. Make them remember you as the one who gets out of the cycle downward that all self-doubt and self-made angels make. Too many people fancy themselves myth without knowledge of why those stories get passed down. Do not waste these wings, dear Icarus, as so many before us have. Fly, just fly. Uh, that one has always been hard to read. Uh, giving your child up to college is it sucks you know and i've done it a couple of times but i don't know it's starting to get old i don't like it all right uh, i'm going to end with one uh about california um i moved here about 10 years ago i've never been to california before that um that well i take it back i was on one book tour and i told my friend bo williams i'll be back you know this place is great Growing up, I had what I called Califobia. I was afraid of coming here because I knew I would stay. And I am here and I stayed. So this is California after Brennan to Frisco. The drought continues to make the news. Magic is born. The magic maker dies. They shout fire in a crowded forest. Scream scroll and radio squall his name. Another golden calf passed. Last night, the golden earth burns. It is easy to think you are important here, like you found it and have the key. Everyone does get to be king or queen or anything in between when you come to the palace of the midnight dusk. Just don't ask for a plastic straw when those things can be injected into deflated egos. This land of hippies and rednecks that live in the same sin field sandboxes and mountainsides, we hold hands awkwardly. We argue in front of City Hall, all suntanned and day drunk. This is the land of plastic pastimes, police presence, and not so much police protection. This is not the glass paint heaven most have built it to be. The sand on these beaches is not as pristine as they would have you believe. There are bodies buried beneath those lifeguard towers and volleyball nets. Blood is in the water and the sharks are innumerable. You will be bitten. Welcome to California. Let me show you around. We got weed farms next to holy sites, five-star hotels next to trap houses, city halls inside strip malls, pot shops next door to cop shops, Sacramento is Memphis without the music, Fresno is Birmingham without the steel, Bakersfield is Tulsa but hotter, LA is a suburban sprawl except it's melting in San Francisco. Oh, poor, I mean rich, originally well-intentioned San Francisco. It used to be a gleaming city on several hills, now has become that Karen in your neighborhood that cries when you call her a Karen but calls the cops for barbecues in a city she doesn't even live in. This is the state that birthed and killed Harvey Milk. This is the state that brought you Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon, Devin Nunes, and Kevin Fuckoff McCarthy. The evil here is hiding in your Driscoll's fruit and blue diamond almonds hate that grows big as a redwood except faster with even smaller seeds. We feed most of the country. We get most of the country drunk on our wine. We get all of the country high on our weed. We export our vices more than any other state. The rest of the country hates us for all the wrong reasons. They hate us because we take in their outcasts, take their trash and turn it into sunshine, sell it back to them after we make it fashionable. They come here to marvel at our beautiful home and us, 
then back up the toilet, leave litter everywhere. They put their sunburned asses and slam the door on the way out. Then they go back to Iowa or whatever and tell everyone how crazy the whole thing is. The whole thing is crazy. How could it not be? We're the most chaotic state in the country and we are fucking proud of it. We are vast and we contain multitudes. Welcome to California. Enjoy your stay. Thank you. That's great. It's a wonderful catalog. And uh, a lot of us that know California are like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. San Francisco. Oh, yeah. That was awesome. Thanks, Will. So we're going to uh, close out with our features here. We're going to do a lightning round and have one last poem from each of our features this evening. And they will go in this order. So I will not come in between in between them. So they're just going to go in this order with one poem apiece. Uh, up first will be Carrie and then Will and then Hilda will close us out for the evening. Carrie, take it away. Hi there. So I want to read something from my new book that will be out in a few weeks. Um, it's at the printers. This is called Maryland's Self-Portrait um, Oil on Canvas. And it's the, the whole book is ekphrastic poems that I wrote to this painting that is a self-portrait by the artist that I bought at a charity auction. Um, and then it, I propped her up on my desk near where I write and she kind of just sat there and stared at the family for weeks and the kids, I have five kids and they were like, who is that lady and why is she staring at us all the time? Um, so this is a book from here, or a poem from this book. It's called Marilyn Bears Witness. Like it or not, she sees all, at least in this one room. My cussing at computer slowness and online banking, kids playing video games, dust gathering on bookshelves. I'm not sure how far out the window she can see, but she must be relieved each morning when the shades are raised, when green and bird song return, or even winter silver rather than the same three walls. She must hate us by now in our stupid vinyl carpet drywall box. She must remember all the other people out there, all the other theirs beyond here. She will roll her eyes at us if she could or close them, cover her ears, run. I should listen to music more in this room or read aloud or watch documentaries about her favorite film stars or Brazil or humpback whales. I should move her to a different room each day or bring her on vacation prop her in the windows of the airplane, taxi, hotel room, cast those eyes away from me. Thanks everyone. Okay, there we go. Um, this is about me moving um, away from Chicago and moving away from the Midwest and uh, moving to California. Uh, Maggie is Chicago. <laughs> Maggie was more than just a dancer, though a dancer is a wonderful thing to be. She sang lovely songs across my shattered spine that scattered my bones like buckshot. She was a wonderful dancer. I watched her sway in a sauna it wasn't a sauna, but it was wood and it was hot and she had almost molten rock that glowed candy apple red in the middle of her chest. These rocks glowed like I assume hell to be if I believed in hell, but she seemed as close to God as possible if I believed in God, but I don't believe in God or hell. I believe in cities that grow like mold. She was full of satin skin and broken arms, not broken now, broken before. A scar wrapped pinwheel across her arm I thought was decoration. She told me it was battle wound from the night she was held hostage for her head and nothing else. She had the smallest hand. I held her for the exact same amount of time Jesus was dead, but Jesus didn't die. I wonder what he did in that cave for three days. Maybe he just laid there as powerless as all the women God talks about in the Bible. Maggie isn't as awful as God or the bottle that makes her feel it. When the other shoe drops, it sounds like a departing train, a jet engine. Her other shoe is a teardrop, falls feather slow, still hits the ground like car crash, the most beautiful car crash. She is a smoky bar trap door 
a jukebox that plays all of the hits from 2005 to 2006. We screamed, fuck the world, I'm hanging out with you tonight. Somehow we knew all the lyrics, although we hadn't heard that tune since high school. I wrote her a poem about tin cans in the dark and left it there for her to find. It said, I'm not sure how to hold a flashlight or believe in any ghosts other than myself or God. And then I wrote in a poem, wake up Maggie, I think I got something to say to you. I wrote in that poem that she was an unanimated corpse. I walked zombie across Grand, stumble spilled soda smooth across Madison. This neighborhood is nicer than the black tar slush it claims to be. Thank you. All righty. So um, <clears throat> this poem is special to me. Um, I, th I think it's the, one of the first poem, if not poems, if not the first poem I wrote um, upon moving to Bloomington. Something that was really important to me. I come, I come from the slam scene, you slam scene. And sometimes we get trained to kind of display our trauma all the time. So something that was really important to me was um, finding joy, even within those difficult um, stories and within a difficult narrative. So this poem is called Springtime. Um, if you're from, if you if you've been in Bloomington for a while, you've, you might have heard it before. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm not the same curmudgeonly 23 year old I was when I um, arrived to Bloomington almost eight years ago. I'm 31 now. My life is completely different. And I'm just grateful to be here um, in this full circle moment with you all. So this is springtime. Sometimes what goes on here is enough to make me sad forever. But then sometimes it's springtime and the ice cream man has good humor, strawberry shortcake pops in abundance. And the man in the store calls me girl with a lot of books because the accent mark in my name makes his throat itch. And he gives me an extra nickel in my change because I smile real big and I buy little Debbie snacks every day, honey buns and nutty bars and oatmeal cream pies. And I'm like, look how much I can eat and never get fat which comes to bite me in the ass and puberty comes, but that does not come in spring. Just to note this, I'm not of size anymore. I lost, I was very sick with my pregnancy. I don't read this poem that often anymore. So I forgot about this comment. So I'm gonna omit that in the future, just to let you know. And when I get you, and when I got home from school, mama is filling her big woman arms in the air because El Gran Combo's music is on and the windows are all open and the purple sheets we claim as curtains blow in and out to dance in unison and springtime reminds me that Papa was alive once, how he is still most alive after equinoxes and he's so proud of how he stayed, of how we never go hungry, even when there's only butter in the fridge. Tis the season to forget you were ever sad, forget that teachers think you cut unkempt, forget you know law so well, you can keep a straight face during eulogies. Springtime is faithful, comes right after my birthday, like packages from distant aunties who live in a place that does not have spring, but I pray they have tulips in their gardens and feel the same sun that gives me so much warmth. I swear my bones yellow, the same sun that makes sure my mama tries to grow peppers and tomatoes and I forget that I'm not her favorite child because she can make colors pop out of dirt and I am so in awe of her magic. Even now, when things feel bleak, I remember spring and universe gives me sunshine, warms the back of my neck, all intimate like, and that is the joy. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Hilda, that was wonderful. That's a great, uh, a great closer for our uh, poets this evening. On this chilly evening, let's uh, let's have a final musical number from our musical guest Forbes Graham, and then I'll come back with some closing uh, some closing comments. Forbes.
Yeah, amazing. It's wonderful. Thank you very much, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. It was a real blessing to be with y'all, y'all tonight. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Forbes Graham, our musical guest for this evening. I also want to thank our poetry features tonight, Will Gibson, Hilda Davis, and Carrie Troutman. This was just a fantastic show. I'm really thrilled to have, uh, have had everyone here tonight. I want to invite you back next month on Wednesday, March 2nd, when we will feature poets uh, Karen George, who I think joined us on Zoom tonight, uh, poets Karen George and Jason Baldinger. We we'll also have a short film by Rwandan filmmaker Gilbert Indahayo and uh, live music by bassist extraordinaire Damon Smith. That is uh, next month uh, on Wednesday, March 2nd, also at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is going to do it for our icy February edition of the Writers Guild Spoken Word Series. Everybody hunker down tonight because I guess it's coming. Uh, but I want to thank everybody for being here and uh, thank you to uh, our listeners and viewers in the future who will encounter this video later. Thanks again to everybody for being here and have a good night. Thank you. Y'all take care now. <laughs>